We just recently started a new series of sermons and we're going to continue with that, truthfully speaking. And as we are looking today, we're addressing the, the issue about sin. So truthfully speaking, the truth about sin. I want you to understand something. Please realize I am a sinner. Do I have any sinners in the house? But let me tell you something. I am a sinner saved by the grace of God. Not because I deserve it, not because I'm a pastor, but I am an individual who realized I was a sinner and I turned to the only one that was capable of atoning for my sin. Well, the truth about sin, if it is the truth that the Word of God has the ability to set mankind free, or that truth has the ability to set mankind free, then why is mankind drawn to the untruths that are so prevalent about us? You know what I'm talking about. For example, when I began to, to say people are drawn to things that they agree with, whether it's truthful or not. If you are swayed to a certain belief or a certain mindset, you will fall into that category of listening to those individuals who you agree with and you're not willing to look and to dig for the truth. We have individuals, have always had individuals as long as I've been alive, and I know it goes back uh, uh, to the biblical days, and, and uh, we, we can begin to realize there are those individuals who love to keep up on the latest gossip. Do you know anybody that listens to gossip? Wait a minute. Do you know somebody that listens to gossip? You know somebody that, uh, you know, maybe you're not saying, well, I know somebody that listens to gossip because you're afraid I'm going to ask, do you listen to gossip? And I could even go on to the aspect of saying, do you spread gossip? I shouldn't say that, right? Well, now, preacher, now you didn't have to ask that. You didn't have to say that today. You should not say that because we, we know that in this culture today, people love a juicy story about somebody, don't they? But the problem is when you get into the area of the gossip that's going around, what really tends to happen is gossip, and I jotted down this, gossip is often a little bit of truth with twists and turns added. How about that? It, it is because you hear or you hear one thing and you don't repeat it exactly, you repeat it how you want to. We twist and we turn it and we make it even juicier to where that news about the pastor or that news about that person that goes to that church or that church is, you know, and, and the gossip goes out in this community. Let me say something. We, we live in a county that's bad at that. Amen? Gossip. I wonder if, if we could remove gossip. Well, you know, and, and even in the area of the sin, the concept of sin that's going on in our area, we realize that uh, somehow we have mistruths. We have individuals who don't think about it, who don't view things as sin today that was viewed as sin five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, or even more. Even churches are turning their backs upon the truth of God's Word, and it's turning their backs upon the truth of God's Word about a three-letter word known as sin. And right in the middle of S-I-N is I. And that's where the problem happens. It happens when we somehow, we fabricate this area of the truth about sin. So human nature or human desire, which is it? Is it, are, are you sinning because of human nature or is it because of your desire? Which is it? Is it the concept of the fact that you as an individual uh, are, are drawn to such things as this? Is help available for us to overcome this problem that we have? Or are we doomed? I got news for you. We have a problem, but we're not doomed. 
There is power to overcome sin. So truthfully speaking, we're going to look at a couple of passages of Scripture. We're going to look at some things in regards to this. And we can realize that God can help you overcome your sin. Now that's what I want you to realize. I don't want you to look at anybody else's sin. Because that's not going to do you any good. What that does is it calls you to look into the area of gossip. What can I say about that person? Is that person living the Christian life like they all talk? See, it's not about somebody else. It is about you. And God can help you overcome your sin. Whatever sin you have. Uh, the, the scriptures that we have is in the book of James. You can go ahead and turn there. In the book of Romans, you can go ahead and turn there. But I want to open with one of the verses we looked at last week. And that's not on the PowerPoint, but it's 1 John chapter 1, verse 8 through 10. Now this is what the Word of God, point blank, says in regards to sin. It says, if we, that is, if you say that you don't have sin... You deceive yourselves, and the truth is not in you. Okay? You need to understand that what the Word of God is establishing here is this concept of the, the all individuals being included in sin. Now, verse 9 says, If we confess our sins, hallelujah, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Hallelujah. All unrighteousness. My past sins, my present sins, my future sins, all unrighteousness. If I bring it to the presence of Jesus Christ, it is forgiven me. If we say, verse 10, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar. Okay, here, here you go. Well, I'm not, I'm, I've not committed sin. And when individuals do that, what you have taken and you've said that, well, God is a liar because God says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So look at in verse 10, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So when we look at this concept, we realize that God has the ability to help us to overcome our sins in our lives. And there's basically two types of sins. You've heard them. Hopefully you're aware of them, and that is the, uh, the two types of sins is the sins of omission and the sins of commission. You say, well, now there's some of those big words that I just don't understand what it is. Well, what it basically says is we're guilty, and uh, the sins of commission basically are the fact that, like the commandments, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false wisdom, thou shalt not covet, thou shalt have no other. When you begin to get into that concept, the sense of commission is the area of doing what you shouldn't do. That is the sense of commission. Now, the sense of omission, when you go into the book of James, uh, chapter 4 and verse 17, you begin to find out the sense of omission is no, God tells you, that God places upon you the mindset that you ought to do something and you don't do it. It isn't that you don't know to do it, it's just that you, you know you should do it and you ought to do it. That is, if you know you ought to do good for somebody and you're not doing it, guess what you've done? You've committed sin. That's what James chapter 4 verse 17 talks about. So we have sins of commission, we have sins of omission, and why we begin to realize and go into this concept, where does sin come from? Have you ever pondered that question? Where did sin come from? Well, you know, the, the human aspect, when you get into this bracket of where sin comes from, we realize that some people blame God. Well, God created sin. Is that true? Well, God created, you know, mankind, and God allowed mankind to have the free choice, so therefore God created the sin. Well, when you go to the Word of God, you find out that that is not the truth. What God did is He allowed man to free choice in order to where man can truly love God by man's choice. God already loves us. And when we as individuals uh, submit to God, when we put our trust in God, we are saying, God, we love you. It is the free choice that we have. Look with me to James chapter 1. In the Bible, James chapter 1, we began to see that uh, this was one of the things that was going on. He says here, James is trying to clarify some of the problems that people in the early church were having. And he says, uh, let no man say, now this is about temptation. 
And people are debating, well, you know, does God tempt us? And the truth is, when you go to the, the original manuscripts, back to the meaning of these words, God tests us, Satan tempts us. There is a difference in a test and a temptation. Okay? Some of us are saying, well, I don't see the difference there. Well, there is a difference because God tests us knowing that we have the capability to do the right thing. How can we do the right thing? How is it possible for us to be tested and do the right thing? Because God knows what you are able to do. God has given us the power. He has equipped us to be overcomers. We don't have to give in to that. But look here at James chapter 1. It says, uh, verse 12, let's begin there at verse 12. It says, uh, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. So it is this concept, we are tested. But in the area of temptation to do evil, God does not tempt you to do evil. God wants you to do good. So this temptation of sin, well, let's go on because it establishes here this concept of sin. Uh, God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man, every individual is tempted when they are drawn away of their own lust and enticed. Then when lust has conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. So we begin to see this concept of what's going on. Do not hear, my beloved brethren, verse 16. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, cometh down from the Father of lights, of whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. So we can begin to see, of his own will begot he us the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. So here's, here's the concept. This area of sin, some people are blaming God. God, it's your fault. God, you could have stopped sin from ever happening. Now let me ask you, let's be honest. Could God have stopped man from sinning? Yes, God could have. But if God stopped us from sinning, where is the free will? Where is the free choice that you have as men and women, young and old, to make the decision to choose to do right or to do wrong? We have that ability to choose right or to choose wrong in our generation. And some individuals are even in the concept of saying that some individuals say that we choose to sin. This is the nurture, uh, the human nature or the human, uh, basically the desire. The nature or desire, the concept. And some say that we choose to sin. That is the, the human desire. Do we choose to sin? Is it possible that in our culture today, Sin is your choice. You desire it and you choose to do whatever it takes in order to accomplish or to have whatever it is that you're wanting. Is that possible that that is what sin is? The answer to that is yes. It is a part of the, the desire that goes on in the lives of individuals. And we realize that, that sin is just running free in us. But some individuals go into the area of others say that it's our nature. So this is the debate. Is sin your choice or is sin because you're human? Is it your nature? Are you sinning because you have no choice or are you sinning because you have choice? The answer to that, let me, let me go ahead and share it with you. The answer to that is yes. You are sinning because it is your nature to sin. You are also sinning because you choose to sin. You make the choice to commit sin. And when we realize this concept, we realize that we, being born of this flesh and bone, being descendants of Adam, we are guilty of sin. And some individuals uh, get in their minds that, well, I just can't comprehend what Adam did so many th uh, hundreds of years and thousands of years ago is, a, is my problem today. Well, let's look in the Bible with me for just a moment. I want you to, to go over to the biblical aspects about sin. And when we look at the biblical aspects about sin, over in Romans chapter 5, we begin to get an insight to what is going on. 
In this concept, we realize and we know and we understand basically that human nature, human nature, birth, flesh and blood has the concept of having us bound in this sin, sinfulness. That's the truth about sin. You, uh, because you are human, are going to sin. We are descendants of Adam. Trace your heritage back. I guarantee it that every individual who is alive or who has ever lived can trace their descendants somehow all the way back to Adam. Because if it wasn't for Adam and what God did, we wouldn't be here. You say, well, I can, I can only go back a few generations, which is in, in my case. We've tried, I've had uh, family members much older than I who have tried to trace our heritage back and uh, they can go back just a few uh, generations, but that's it. And, and we don't exist, so to speak. But let me tell you something. The reality is, is it can be traced all the way back to Adam. And if you really want to get a little bit closer than from Adam, because Adam's so far back, every one of us can be traced back as descendants of Noah. Is that true? Think about that. The flood. If the flood wiped everybody out, and I believe what the Bible says, that's what we learned last week. If the flood wiped everybody out, only Noah's family survived. Therefore, we are descendants of Noah. Noah was a descendant of Adam, so we can begin to live. Well, let's move on in this concept. What we have, the biblical aspects about sin, is basically everybody is a sinner. No one is exempt from sin. Look at Romans chapter 5, now down to verse 12. Wherefore, that is... This whole what he said before in chapter 5 uh, it is the connection here. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin. So death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Now, some are saying, well, what Adam did is what Adam did, and what I do is what I do. So therefore, I am not an individual who is a part of this sinful nature. Now, let me ask you this. What does the Bible say right there? It says, basically, as by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin. So here, here's, here's the test. Let me say this. If you didn't have sin, the sin nature in your life, some part of your life, if you didn't have sin nature in your life, guess what? I got good news for you. You're never going to die. Is it, I mean, isn't that what he says here? Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Do you know why that you have this human nature? Do you know why it's a proven fact? Because you're going to die. This is decaying. Because of what Adam did and Eve did back in the garden, it is passed upon every one of us. If we were sinless, we would not die. But in essence, we are going to die. So everybody, we know, everybody is a sinner. We also know that sin leads us away from God. We go into the concept, we began to look that when sin happens, it brings upon this curse of, of the human nature that, that we are in pain, we are in agony, we sweat. Man, I would have loved to have been in the garden. You know, it was a perfect temperature. What's your perfect temperature? Well, I can almost say that in the garden, when Adam was walking, it was the perfect temperature for Adam. And when Eve was walking, it was the perfect temperature for her. Because that, you know, let's face it. Some of us are different one from another. Some of us like it colder. Some of us like it hotter. Okay? So I, I just look at the garden as being that perfect temperature. Wherever I walked, it would be, it would be a perfect 68 degrees. Some of you are like, yeah, uh-huh. Some of you say, give me my coat. Well, you wouldn't need your coat because it'd be your perfect temperature of, of 86 degrees, whatever you want. But sin has that ability and it leads us away from God. And we know that because sin breaks and it establishes to us, sin breaks the fellowship. We have fellowship with God. And what sin did, go back to the very beginning. The rule of thumb, you, you want to find out the truth of God's word, you go back to the origin of this situation of sin, and you find out what happened at the beginning in the original sin, and you find out that fellowship was broken. 
Adam and God, Adam and God and Eve, they walked in the presence of God daily. And all of a sudden, because they have committed sin, they're hiding over in the bushes and the fellowship is broken. And that fellowship was broken and it basically, it had consequences that we realize that there are consequences because of our sin that is, is established to us. In Romans 5, 17, it says, For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of, of righteousness shall receive in life by one Jesus Christ. So we have this consequences. Sin brings the consequences of death. Who do you know that hasn't died? Well, you know the people who are living, I know that. But you know what I'm saying? Who do you know that is not going to die? We're all dying one moment closer and we don't know when will be our last breath. When will be the last tick of your heart? You see sin, biblical aspect, sin, has consequences. It brought death. And not only in that concept of sin has consequences through the word of God, we find out that the biblical aspect about sin is that there needs to be an atonement, there needs to be something to uh, supplement, something to take away the ultimate consequences of sin. And that is in Romans chapter five and verse, five, uh, verse 19, for as by one man, disobedience many were made sinners so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous so we look and we see that what sin has done to us it needs someone to atone for it and what we have is given to us in Romans chapter 5 and we know that if you go back to the previous verses it says basically that God commendeth in verse 8 there but God commendeth his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners Christ died for us that is the atonement Christ died for us but here's the thing Christ died for everybody but everybody hasn't received the atonement that Christ offers us because you got to believe it in here. You got to have the faith. You got to trust. You got to believe it. And you got to turn from your sins. And we began to see that uh, very important truth. So atonement is required. And then we realize that only, only God can do this. God alone can help you. There is no help elsewhere. You can't get help to overcome the consequences of sin. The wages of sin, according to the word of God, the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. We deserve death. But God alone can help us. I can't undo my sin. I cannot undo my sin nature. As much as you'd like to think, you're not going to live forever. You are going to die. And that's why it's so important that we present the message of Jesus Christ and we help individuals come to receive Christ and believe Christ and to trust Christ. Maybe not understanding it all, but just saying, Lord, what the word of God says, I'm a sinner and therefore I cannot save myself. I need to turn to you. Go back to our opening of 1 John chapter 1, uh, verse 8 through 10. You begin to see that, that we need to confess. We need to come to him because he will cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Jesus. Only God can do that. Also, we realize that sin itself is defeated. Sin is destroyed. And when we realize that sin is defeated and sin is destroyed, we have that understanding of what God is doing for us. There in verse uh, 21 of uh, Romans chapter 5, it says, That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ. Sin will reign in us until death but the righteousness of Jesus Christ reigns while we are alive and forever that is when we receive Christ when we turn our lives over to Jesus Christ sin is defeated by God it's defeated I don't have to worry about it it's defeated well let me go into the the, the last thing in the area of the biblical aspect about sin because people often ask this is temptation sin? Well, let me state this. Temptation is not sin. Being tempted, being tested, being tried is not sin. 
When we are tempted by the devil, when we are tested by God, what makes it sin is the outcome. Remember what James is talking about, the enticement that's you know, it's going on in our mind, we mull it over in our mind, and then lo and behold, we bring it out into an action. See, t being tempted is not sin. You say, well, I think it is. Well, let me just say this. If being tempted in, is sin, then therefore Jesus Christ is a sinner. Jesus was tempted. Do you think it wasn't a temptation what he experienced in the wilderness? Jesus was tempted. He was tested. The devil offered Jesus everything. And you know, I could just imagine. Here's Jesus. Here's the devil. Hey, Jesus, you see all this? I'm going to give it all to you. And Jesus is thinking, hmm, don't you know who I am? I already have it all. And you're trying to give me something that's not yours to give? Isn't that what a devil does? He tries to give you something that's not his. But Jesus was tempted. Not only there, but on the cross of Calvary, we know that Jesus himself was tempted. So we know that he, 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 he had his own will, his own desire. He says, Father, not my will. You see, there was the humanity and the divine nature. The humanity says, I, I don't want to go to the cross. But the divine nature says, Lord, Father, if there's no other way, I'll go. He was tempted. He could have called the angels to deliver him. Christ was tempted. So please understand this. Being tempted is not in and of itself sin. Temptation is not sin. It's what you do after you're tempted. Do you give in to the temptation? Well, let me give you what you can do about your sin. Three things, very simple. Number one, you need to acknowledge it, your sin. You need to acknowledge it, whatever it is. You know what your sin is. The truth about sin is you need to acknowledge your sin. Pride, arrogance, lying, cheating, stealing, whatever it might be. You need to acknowledge your sin. You need to fess up to the acknowledgement that you are a sinner. Because if you are guilty of one sin, you are a lawbreaker. And if you are a lawbreaker, then you have the hope of realizing that you don't have the capability of overcoming all this aspect of the consequences of sin. And therefore, you will need to turn to Jesus Christ. We turn to Christ. We go into the area of turning to Jesus Christ. What you can do about your sin, you acknowledge it. And then when you acknowledge it, you realize just how bad a sinner you are. And you turn to Jesus Christ. And not only do you turn to Jesus Christ, but what you do next is you as an individual turn to Christ for forgiveness. Turn to Christ to where you say, Lord, here am I. Take me and use me. That is, we live for Him. We identify with Him. I want to follow Jesus Christ. I don't want to be associated with the sinfulness of this world. I want to be associated with, with the nature of Jesus Christ, being a follower of Jesus Christ. I want to live for Him. And in this concept of what we begin to realize that we can begin to be overcomers. Read over in 1 John, you're going to find out that we can overcome sin. Where do we get it that we can overcome sin? Is sin more powerful than God? The answer is no. God is more powerful than the sin in our lives. And there's not a sin that you have committed that God hasn't and isn't willing to forgive you of and to give you the power to walk in the newness of the life that he has given us. One of the biggest problems we have today is all the lies that people believe about sin. Well, sin's really not that bad. Well, I can't help myself, you know. I'm, after all, it's human nature for me to sin, to go around sin. And, you know, we go around making excuses. Well, I committed a sin because of them and her and that. and the, All these other things we do. Sin is not to be taken as something you get and you begin to have control over because truth is you don't have control over sin. I don't have control over sin apart from Jesus Christ. See, let me finish that. 
I don't have control over sin without the help of Jesus Christ. Human nature, we know what being tempted is. And we are prone, if we stay in that environment, prone to give in to the temptation. But when we turn to Christ, we can begin to realize that we, are, we can be overcomers. Sin will literally control and destroy an individual's life now in this present world and in the future. What kind of relationship do you have with Christ? I want you to think about that for a moment. What kind of relationship do you have with Christ? Then next I want you to think about have your sins, your sins, are your sin, singular or plural? Have your sins been forgiven? Say, well, I'm, tr I'm trying to do all I can. No, 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 no. Have your sins be forgiven. Your sins are only forgiven when you take them to the cross and say, Jesus, I believe you died to atone for my sins. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And I close out with this. Don't let sin keep you out of heaven. Don't let sin keep you out of heaven. Because it will. It will. If you haven't been cleansed by Jesus Christ, if you haven't put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, then your sin is going to keep you out of heaven. But if you come to Him, no matter what you have done, if you come to Him, He will pardon you. He will forgive you. He will justify you what verse 9 of Romans 5 says we're justified by his blood let's pray Father we do pray that we would understand as we gather here that we would understand that we are in spiritual needs we would understand that we are sinners and therefore, we need a Savior. And the truth about sin is, what we couldn't do, God, you did for us. And the simple aspect is, all we have to do is, is to take that leap of faith, that step of faith. What you're going to do in our lives, how you're going to do it, Father, that, that's yet to be written. But we need to step out and say, Lord, I'm a sinner. I'm guilty. And sin brings the consequences of death. I'm going to die. And if we're not prepared to die, we need to get prepared to die. Because eternity lasts a long time. Help us to realize that truth. In the name of Christ, I pray. Amen.